Greetings everybody, Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part 19 of Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. This is actually part three of this book. It's called the veil lifted from the Abrahamic nations. The chapter one is called Lost Israel and the First Overturn Located. As a caption, he has the following words. If I have told you of earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things. And that was Jesus speaking to Nicodemus that came to him by night. One other thing I want to read. Now, this is not part of the book, but I deem it important, so I'm going to read it. And since this is my video, I guess I get to decide what's what, right? Uh, the book that hardly anybody of the so-called Christian faith ever reads is the book of Genesis. I mean, it's, it's sad. It's the foundation of the Bible. Genesis is the foundation of the Bible. And very few people have ever read it. You know, I've talked to people and they say, Oh, I'm a Christian. And I say, oh, can you name 10 books in the Bible? You know, most of the time they can't. I'm like, really? Really? You can't name 10 books in the Bible? So you've never read 10 books in the Bible. Really? So Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9... 99 years old, people. That's how old my grandmother was when uh, she died. Uh, let me let you know a little story. Uh, Grandma was uh, four months away from being 100 years old. And uh, the presidency of the United States has a thing that if you uh, tell them that... Uh, you got a somebody that's coming approaching 100 years old the president will send a birthday card for your 100 year old uh family member of course you got to tell them up you know a few months in advance but so we were getting ready to you know let them know but she passed but uh i remember one day i asked her grandma what is the secret to long life and she told me, stay away from doctors. Stay away from doctors. They'll fill you up with pills. Boy, was that the truth. So, yeah. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Hmm. Does uh, 16 to 18 million you-know-whos, does that sound like God ex uh, multiplied them exceedingly? You know, I'm talking about the world population of the you-know-whos. Uh, 18 million is about the top number, I think. You know, at least it was when I checked it a few years ago. That's the being multiplied exceedingly? Really? Verse 3, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is, is with thee. My covenant is with you, Abram, and thou shalt be a father of many 
nations. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. So one little nation over in the Middle East created by the Antichrist United Nations in 1948 uh, to the church world, that is the fulfillment of this promise of God to Abram. Hmm. A father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be any more uh, any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings, kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed, children, after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God." God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Oh, yeah. You see, modern dispensational theology turns God into a liar. But, hey, they don't bother to read the Bible, so, you know, they, and they don't ask the questions. Um, I, my comments are being shadow banned on other videos. I used to spend a lot of time going on other people's videos and making comments, especially like the, the pre-tribbers. There's a guy called Les Federick, Flederick, I don't, Fedlerick or whatever his name is, and uh, Zionist dispensational pre-trib rapture guy and i was going to leave a couple of comments and i was reading the comments people left on his channel oh what a great bible teacher and how wonderful you are and you know blah, blah, blah. and you know i realize they deserve to be deceived they really do they don't bother to read the bible they just listen to these bible teachers you know if the Bible teacher told him that uh, Jesus used to hang from his toes upside down from a tree and uh, pick his nose. They would probably uh, make that, put that into their their belief system. You know, they're they're idiots. They deserve to be deceived. They really do. So, all right. Well. I've talked long enough on my own stuff, but uh, let's read chapter one, part three, chapter one, lost Israel and the first overturn located. This is page 219. The fact that a great nation composed of ten tribes of the posterity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is lost or unidentified among the nations of the world is well known to enlightened students of the Old Testament. This truth has been a source of such great mystery that it has both puzzled the minds and engaged the interest of men to such an extent that many of them who are the intelligent peers of the world, have bent their best energies to the work of hunting for this lost nation. Thus, for many years, devout minds have been investigating secular and sacred history, as well as sacred prophecy, which must have become, or which must yet become, history. These men have carefully traced not only the perfectly connected outlines, but also the details of history. 
Hence, they confidently assert there are no missing links in the chain of racial and national events. And yes, people, there is a racial component to the Bible. Absolutely. Contrary to what the Yuda who owned media says. Absolutely. A large percent of the men who have been thus engaged are eminent in religious, historic, and scientific research. Men who have called to their age, uh, called to their aid, chrono chronology, astronomy, archaeology, ethno ethnology, ethnology, pyramidology, and philosophy. Indeed, they have used any and every science that could throw any possible light upon the subject. For they have been irrepressible in their search after facts and are men who purpose for the truth's sake that the word of God shall be forced to stand every test, be it ever so crucial that its own internal matter demands. Bob's note here. Do you know that there was a guy, his pen name was Mark Twain? Yeah, Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn. His name, his real name was Samuel Clemens. And he was an atheist. Why? He said, well, he examined the Bible and concluded that the promises of God were not true. Of course, listening to the church world, they attributed God's promises to the wrong people. I mean, can you imagine if, um, let's say there was a, a robbery at a store and a blue car sped away. That was the getaway vehicle. But the store clerk says the car was green. Calls the police and says, there's a green car. Just robbed the store and took off heading north. Police are going to be looking in the wrong place for a green car when it was blue. Yeah, you're looking the wrong place. Samuel Clemens was looking at the you-know-whos because the church world told him that. And he didn't figure out that who the real people of the book were. You know, after the Civil War, you'd heard about the carpetbaggers that came down to uh, the South and, uh, you know, stole everything and, you know, destroyed everything. Who do you think they were? President Grant, who was a general during the Civil War, um, tried to uh, stop them from doing that. But, uh, yeah, didn't always work out. But he tried when he heard what they were doing. And then the stupid people from the South, and by the way, I was born in a Southern state, by the way. Um, they blame the North. Well, it wasn't the people of the North. It was the same people who your Baptist church tells you are the chosen. Yeah, them, them. They are, they are that church's chosen people. Yeah. And honestly, I'm looking forward to the day when the chosen people start chopping off the heads of uh the church goers. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father and his angels. So, yeah. I want to see them either get their heads chopped off or deny Christ. And then they'll say, but Jesus, uh, eternal security. I said the sinner's prayer at a Billy Graham, Billy Goat Graham uh, revival thingy. I said the sinner's prayer, Jesus, please come into my heart and save me. 
you know, if there's no change in people's lives, you know, was the conversion real? You know, you don't have to, you, you won't have to leave your, your drinking buddy friends. They'll leave you. When, when, you, when a true conversion happens, it's just amazing. You know, a lot of, that's, that's one of the reasons why I left the believing in Jesus that I, when I was in junior high school. Because they taught us that the you-know-whos, the people that Jesus called the children of the devil, were the chosen people. Yeah. And I grew up with them. I grew up with them. I live among the third largest concentration of them in the United States. New York City is first. L.A., California is second. And South Florida is third. You know, you can go live in a little tiny town in Georgia and there might not be any of them. But you go down here, there's, yeah. All right, let me quit. Let me quit ranting and raving and I'll shut up and start reading the book. It is the consensus of opinion among this class of men, the number of whom is increasing daily, that the once lost ten tribes of Israel are found. Be they right or wrong, we are sure of this one thing, namely that there is a race of people here amongst other races who do not know their ancestral origin and who possess all the distinguishing marks whereby the scriptures declare the lost house of Joseph shall be found and recognized not only by themselves, but by the rest of the nations of the earth. Still, be this as it may, there is nothing for us to do now but to take up the thread of our story, which is a scarlet one and pertains to the members to those members of the royal family whom we left on the throne of Israel and who are holding the scepter of David de facto instead of the one to whom it belongs de jure and to whom the Lord will give it and not the scepter which belongs to some other royal family race or kingdom while dealing with the breach which occurred in the royal family which had been prophesied of not only in the words which were uttered by the midwife, but by the particular manner of the birth of the Judean Tamar twins, which also had been used as a prophetic type or symbol. We said nothing about the three overturns, which are part of Ezekiel's prophecy concerning some of the chief details of the same breach. One reason for this omission was that we could not give the proof concerning the location of that goodly land to which the royal branches, i.e. Judah's prince and David's princesses, were carried, and in which they were set without making many points in proof of the present whereabouts of the still-preserved seed and the perpetuated crown, throne, and scepter of David. For it was not our desire to give any such proof until we should first prove that the building and planting which Jeremiah's commission involved had been accomplished, and that the transfer of the crown had been made, that the high branch had been dethroned, and that another branch, one equally high by birth, but low only in the sense of non-ruling and because of the law of primogeniture had been exalted by being enthroned. Oh, I got another word to look up. All right, primogeniture. It's a noun. I, I'm re I really love this uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary. I, I really do. Uh, I can't say enough about it. Noah Webster knew 20 some odd languages, including Greek, which is what the New Testament was in, and Hebrew, the Old Testament. The New Testament was in Greek. And uh, 
He knew all the root words. He standardized the spelling of the English language. And he was a scholar and a believer. He was a linguist, which is a language scholar. Primogeniture, noun, Latin, uh, means first. The state of being born first of the same parents, seniority by birth among children. In law, the right which belongs to the eldest son or daughter, thus in Great Britain, the right of inheriting the estate of the father belongs to the eldest son, and in the royal family, the eldest son of the king is entitled to the throne by primogeniture among the females. The crown descends by the right of primogeniture to the eldest daughter only and her issue. Um, before the revolution in America, you know, 1776, primogeniture in some of the American colonies entitled the eldest son to a double portion of his father's estate but this right has been abolished. People, that's right right out of the Bible. The, the double portion. The firstborn was to get a double portion. If you had nine kids, the firstborn kid would get a double portion, especially if it was a son. But uh, it's been a, taken away. So, um, all right, let's keep reading. Now, since we have shown that the Word of God emphatically declares these things to have been accomplished, we are prepared to show that the three prophetic overturns took place and that they took place in connection with these same royal ones together with their succession whom we have followed to a new country. It is not possible to follow the history of these overturns nor to follow further the history of that branch of the royal family which came into power when the breach was made and to do so independent of lost Israel. For it was to Israel that Jeremiah fled with the king's daughters, the same people with whom the royal line of Zerah had been for more than a century prior to the time when Jeremiah joined them. And since that time, nationally speaking, the fortunes and history of the scepter and birthright had have become one. We must remember that the place where this prince and princess were planted was in the height of Israel. That it was all the trees, all the trees in the field of Israel that were to know the low tree had been exalted, that it was Israel, the dry tree, which was made to flourish, and that uh, has been dry hitherto for lack of royal honors and royal blood. But now that a prince and princess of the blood are on the throne, the once dry tree doth flourish, but the former green tree, the uh, Judean kingdom, not the nation, is dried up. We must remember that Israel is the ten tribe nation, the birthright people. Bob's note here, remember, Joseph was given the birthright, the double portion. That's why uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, they were double portion. You know? Oh, where's that chaplain, Bob? That's in Genesis. Read it. Jeez. You know, people don't read. They don't bother to read the Bible. Oh, that's for the you-know-who's, the Old Testament. Uh, no. No, they got their own book. And it's not, it's not the Torah. No. We must remember that Israel is the ten-tribe nation, the birthright people, whose ancient capital was Samaria, whose representative name is Ephraim, the second son of Joseph, to whom pertains the birthright, and that his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were to grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth, that they were to finally to separate, Manasseh to become a great nation, and Ephraim to develop into many nations, a multitude of nations, or a company of nations, as it is variously given. The first of these overturns is the one whose history 
we have essentially given while dealing with the preservation of King Zedekiah's daughters and is the overturn of the kingdom from Palestine to that goodly land by the side of great waters where it took root, took root, grew, flourished, and became a spreading vine. A ripple of holy joy went pulsing through our heart when we found that the prophet had, in his riddle, used the expression spreading vine in connection with Israel. Uh, the spreading, um, in his riddle used the expression spreading vine in connection with Israel, the Hebrew word saw rock, something like that. Spreading as here used is defined in Strong's Concordance to extend, to stretch, to spread, to extend, even to excess. Thus, this new country, this strange and unknown, unknown land in which the royal remnant found the cast out people of Israel is the place from which it is declared that they shall spread out, that they shall exceedingly extend their borders and so fulfill their national destiny. A lot of people in the know believe that um, this applies to the UK, the British Empire. I mean, let's face it, Britain, Britain um, colonized Canada, America, uh, well, the United States, um, a number of of islands in the Caribbean, Caribbean, however you want to pronounce it. You know, you've heard of the British Virgin Islands. Um, ever heard of Australia? How about New Zealand? Yeah. Um, India. I mean, um, Singapore. Hong Kong. You know, there was a... Um, uh, the Cook, the Cook Islands, you know, Captain Cook, Mutiny on the Bounty, I think it was, yeah. Um, do you know that there was a saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire? The British Empire, it was daylight somewhere on the British Empire, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, yeah. Uh, is that the vine spreading? People can't deny it. They want you to think the you-know-whos are um, fulfill all these prophecies. They don't. They don't fulfill these prophecies. They can't be the people of the book. They can't be. It's impossible. That's why Samuel Clemens lost his, you know, didn't believe the book. Because he was lied to by preachers. So, I don't purposely lie about the Bible to uh, anybody. Because I know one day, I'm going to be called into an account. And I'm going to have to give an account to the Lord for everything that I've ever taught. Which is why I didn't want this job. I didn't want this job. You think I wanted to be a Bible teacher and get death threats? And... Yeah. You know, I had people say they were going to come over to my house and kill me. I'm not joking. And they even gave me my address. So, <laughs> you think you think I wanted this job? It's just one day I was felt convicted that, you know, well, if if I'm not teaching, who will? And I know I'm not the only one, but you know, there there's just so few. There's very very few preachers that I would trust and want to listen to. Very, very few. Very, very few. So, what can I tell you? I never wanted this job. Never. But, 
I enjoy doing this far more than watching the filth on television much more. You know, if the you know who's were God's chosen people, they would have movies about Samson and not Hercules and not Thor and not, uh, you know, yeah, they wouldn't be having movies about vampires and werewolves and, uh, but um, what can I tell you? All right, uh, the cast out people of Israel is the place from which it is declared that they shall spread out, that they shall exceedingly extend their borders and so fulfill their national destiny. How perfectly this harmonizes with the promises concerning the place which the Lord made to David in connection with the promises concerning their perpetuity of his seed, throne, and scepter, and which was given at the same time as follows. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Children of wickedness, people don't believe that. They say, well, you know, as long as they believe in Jesus in their heart. Uh, yeah. No, the Bible declares children of wickedness. Yeah. At this juncture, we feel, we feel impelled for fear. You will not think it out for yourselves to point out the fact that the Lord had cast Israel out of her land and cast her afar off. And while going to that far off land, she was to be sifted through the nations as corn is sifted in a sieve. I'm kind of disappointed uh, he doesn't give where this is located. Let me look. All right. Um, that's in Amos 9.9. 9. For lo, I, the Lord, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Oh, and that other, um, let's see, 2 Samuel 10, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10. More, uh, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And a second witness is 1 Chronicles 17, 9. Also, I will ordain a place for my people Israel and will plant them and they shall dwell in their place and shall be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more as at the beginning. So, yeah, he, he quotes the Bible, but he doesn't tell you where it, it's at. And I mean, I recognize the verses, but. I don't, I, I have to look it up where they are. Um, all right, so, but, let's read the book. But after they have reached their far off destination, their God appointed place, then they are to move no more. For it is in this reference to the same casting out of the Ephraim nation that Hosea declares, um, the children of Israel May uh, shall abide many days without a king and without a prince. But now with this prophetic riddle fulfilled, their king is with them, and the monarchy of Israel is flourishing as a green or living tree. Our next effort will be to find this far-off land whose history has been one of spreading out, yea, spreading out exceedingly, even excessively. The very fact that the 
you know whose have a record of the birth call and commission of Jeremiah and the history of the execution of the first part of his commission, i.e. the tearing down, rooting out, and plucking up the house and throne of David, this considered in the light of the fact that they can give no account of him after his sudden disappearance from among them is evidence that he neither died nor completed his God-ordained task among them. And all the civilized races of the world know that he did not build that seat of power nor plant those royal scions among the you-know-whos. Um, I got a talking code because, you know, uh, the you-know-whos you know listen to this stuff and when they see certain keywords, they... Uh, censor things yeah it's getting censorship's getting bad uh, but since we find it on record that jeremiah's word has been accomplished we know that it must have been he who did it even if his name is not mentioned in the scriptural account of his doing it for god would not permit some other man to do that work after having sanctified Jeremiah before he was born. Yeah, people, read Jeremiah 1. God called Jeremiah to be a prophet before he was even born. Read Jeremiah 1. Read it. Oh, wait, I got an entire uh, commentary Bible study on Jeremiah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. Um... We must bear in mind the fact that the sacred amount account, that the sacred account of the building and planting is in the form of a riddle or a parable, and that metaphors instead of names are used for those concerned. The high and the low, the enthroned and the dethroned, the young twigs and the tender twigs, the planted and the planter. But we must remember that the name of Israel, the special national name of the ten tribed kingdom, is mentioned as the receiver of the planted and enthroned pair. And since the historic testimony declares Jeremiah's work to have been accomplished in Israel, it is only in Israel that we may hope to find evidence of this fact. This necessitates the finding of Joseph Israel, and they shall be found, for God says they shall. And when they are found, manifestly, there must be found with them a branch of the Davidic family of Judah, who are their sovereigns. Sovereigns, you know, kings, rulers, yeah. Since the East is left in such utter darkness, not only as to the fate of Jeremiah and his little royal remnant, but also as to the destination of the, the dispersed ten tribes who had been lost, even to the uh, Judeans, so long before Christ came that some of them thought that no person except the Messiah could go to them or might even know where to find them, that we must look elsewhere. Also because of their lack of historic data concerning the completion of Jeremiah's work and because his disappearance was almost as marvelous as was the translation of Elijah, Bob's note here, Elijah the prophet. He uh, confronted Jezebel and King Ahab. Oh boy, what a pair they were. Uh, talk about evil incarnate. He uh, confronted them and the, the Satanists called prophets of Baal or Baal. Um, and then one day God took him up in a chariot of fire into heaven and Elijah's coming back one day oh yeah he's going to confront uh, he's going to be one of the two witnesses who confronts the Antichrist the man of sin the son of perdition the beast um, hey I did an hour and 40 minute study on Elijah where I cover pretty much everything he did you know the life and times of Elijah so yeah. So, 
And because his disappearance was almost as marvelous as was the translation of Elijah, they were ready to say that Christ uh, was Jeremiah. And that's in Matthew 16, 14. Their thought was no doubt that Jeremiah, like Elijah, was still alive. And that God would let yet use him in connection with the building and planting anew, or the restoration of the kingdom among them, to which they looked forward with great anticipation and hope. But, as we were saying, since there is no light in the East concerning these matters, let us scan the pages of prophecy to see if there are any straws which point west. And since it is said of straws that they show which way the wind blows, it will be well for us to know that Hosea gives a prophecy concerning Ephraim in which he declares, Ephraim followed, followeth after an east wind. As an east wind is one which blows from the east and travels to the west. You know, think about it. An east wind. Uh, it always shows from what direction the wind is blowing in. So an east wind is coming from the east and going in a western direction. This makes it certain that Ephraim did not travel eastward. For he had for had he gone in an easterly direction, he must needs have been facing an east wind. Then he surely went west, and since he was cast afar off, he must be in the far off west. When Jehovah concerned uh, confirmed confirmed his promise to David concerning the perpetuity of his kingdom. Uh, perpetuity means forever, people. You ever heard of a perpetual motion machine? Yeah. Throne, scepter, and house, and took oath by his holiness that he would not lie to him. He said, I will set his hand, scepter, in the sea. The clues which the prophet Ezekiel gives in his riddle as to the location of Israel and the royal pair are that it is a land of traffic and that it has good soil and that it brings forth branches, that is, that it is a fruitful and populous. We are told it has a city of merchants, that fowl of every wing dwell under the shadow of its branches, i.e. mixed or various people dwell under the protection of its rulers, and that its location is by great waters. Great waters is its location. Does that mean... Uh, the sea, or is it talking about people, or is it talking about both? You know, which for reasons which will become more and more apparent as we proceed, we affirm it to be the Atlantic Ocean. For the Lord gives a message to Ephraim through Jeremiah saying, I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my first born. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattereth Israel will gather him. In this declaration we find that the far off home of Ephraim Israel is in not an island, but the Isles, I-S-L-E-S, i.e. -E a group of islands. Thus Ephraim also is located in the sea in the Isles afar off. Bob's note here. What is Greece? It's a nation of islands, for one thing, right? What was the New Testament written in? Greek. No, it wasn't written in Hebrew and then this translated into Greek, like the so called Hebrew roots heretics will tell you. No, it was written in Greek. But what are what are what are the other islands? All right, let's take a look at uh Isles. You know, Isles is just a shortened form of islands. In Isaiah forty nine one 
we read, O, uh, listen, O isles, unto me and hearken, ye people from far, ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, for the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And that thing that we just read in this book, uh, the quote was from Jeremiah 31 and verse 10. I don't know why he doesn't, uh, when he quotes something, he doesn't put the, the chapter and verse, but it's Jeremiah 31, 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations. Remember, Abraham was to be the father of many nations. O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattereth Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Hmm. Didn't Jesus say he was the good shepherd? Oh, yeah. What isles? Uh, let's see. You got Britain. You got Scotland. Ireland. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you got uh, the United Kingdom. You got Ireland. Uh, have you ever heard of the Isle of Man? Uh, England's got a bunch of little islands uh, connected to their uh, their country. Um, they've even got a group of islands called the Hebrides. H-E-B-R-I-D-E-S. Uh, is that a derivative of Hebrews? I think so. You know? Um, Orkney, have you ever heard of the Orkney Islands? Yeah, you know, it's it, people have no idea for the most part. I mean, there's a few here and there, but yeah, all right. Um, Isaiah 66 and verse 19. And I will set a sign among them and will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish. Uh, Tarshish is from, according to the best scholars that I know of, is an Old Testament name for Spain. To Tarshish, Pul, and Lud that draw the bowl to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. So, all right, uh, let me see here. Where was I? All right, we are on page 226. For the Lord gives a message to Ephraim through Jeremiah, saying, I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare it in the isles of afar off and say he that scattereth Israel will gather him in this declaration we find that the far off home of Ephraim Israel is in not an island but the isles i.e. a group of islands thus Ephraim also located is located in the sea in the isles afar off hmm uh, what nation gave us the King James Bible uh, China? No, no. What China? Japan? No. India? No. Zimbabwe? Congo? Ethiopia? Uh, no. England? Great Britain? The United Kingdom? Yeah. The prophet Isaiah and the 49th chapter addresses these same people saying, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people from afar. Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And this is still in the future. And while speaking in the 12th verse of the same chapter concerning a future return of the same people to Palestine, their former home, at which time he will be more fully glorified in them, 
the Lord causes the prophet to make proclamation. Behold, these shall come from far off, and lo, these shall come from the north and from the west. In the Hebrew, there is no compound word for, word for northwest as we use it, hence the expression north and west. Bob's note here. Take a look at the land of Israel. Look at north and look at west. What do you see? Get a map. I see Europe. Yeah. What is northwest of Israel? The UK. Yeah. Uh, there is a group of isles out in these great waters which are just as directly northwest from Palestine as the lines of latitude and longitude can lay them, namely the British Isles. And we may just as well jump into the midst of our proofs at once, since this is the case where Ephraim Israel shall chiefly be found. If not there, it is because they have spread out from these very isles. Bob's note here. Remember, um, there was an expression, Britain rules the waves. Um, ever since the Battle of Trafalgar, um, Spain used to be a mighty naval power, but Britain surpassed them. And uh, ever since that time, up until the end of World War II, England had the largest navy in the world. Matter of fact, at the beginning of World War II, England had the largest navy in the world. The United States was second. Japan was third. After Pearl Harbor, it was Britain was first, Japan was second, and the United States was third. After Pearl Harbor and um, the Philippines was a large portion of the United States uh, Pacific Fleet, and it was also attacked and destroyed, just like Pearl Harbor. Um, a lot of people don't know about that, but, you know, I'm one of those people that reads a lot of history, and yeah, uh, some people think I have a very boring life, but I enjoy it, and would much rather read about that stuff than... Uh, watch uh, vampire movies on television but hey that's you know just me but um, England had the largest navy in the world until the end of World War II and then the United States by and large had the largest navy in the world do you know at the world, end of World War II the United States had over 100 aircraft carriers just aircraft carriers, a hundred, yeah, and uh, had the largest submarine fleet in the world, which crippled Japan's merchant shipping thing, you know, um, you know, Japan was, they were starving at the end of the war, they were starving, I mean, they were, the, the submarines were sinking uh, Japan's oil and their their food coming by ships and uh yeah england was eclipsed the english navy was eclipsed by the united states navy so yeah and israel was to be a nation uh an ocean going people so when the black hebrews tell you that they're israel um ask them where's where's your where's your navy you know where is it where you know africa has never been known for building ships never never so you know it'll it one of these days it's going to be open warfare against the children of Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's going to be apparent to some people 
who they are. It's going to become quite apparent. So, yeah. All right, let's keep reading. Uh, all right, since that is the place where Ephraim Israel shall chiefly be found, Britain, if not there, it is because they have spread out from these very isles, for it is a well-authenticated fact that Jeremiah went to Ireland, Ireland, where he died, and that his grave is one of the well-known and proudly named spots of the country whose history is one of the mysteries of the world. Bob's note here. Uh, if you listen to the Gaelic and Welsh languages, uh, they sound like Hebrew. And Yiddish is not Hebrew. It just sounds like it. It might even look like it. But those that speak Yiddish, cannot under, they can't read Hebrew Old Testament. They can't do it. They want you to think they can, but they can't. So, but uh, Welsh and uh, the Gaelic language are very close to Hebrew. I think German is too. But uh, hey, what do I know? It is a well-known fact that the history of no country on the face of the earth has so puzzled historians as that of Ireland. There is both a sacred and secular reason for this. The secular reason is that Ireland steps into the arena of history with a monarchical kingdom running in full blast and men do not know how it got there. You know, a monarchy. The sacred reason is because God has issued a mandate saying, Keep silence before me, O isles, and let the people renew their strength. Isaiah 41, verse 1. In the next verse, the Lord asks a question. Who raised up the righteous men from the east? Then in the fourth verse, he answers his own question, saying, I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. And in the eighth verse of the same chapter, still addressing the dwellers in the isles, he says, Thou art Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, i.e. literally from the rising of the sun, from the beginning, or from the east. This statement coming from such high authority forever settles the question as to the origin of the people who dwell in those far-off northwest isles. We have read many authors on the subject of the Hebrews in Ireland who claim to a search carefully and critically through all available chronicles, records, and histories, and they all agree that a perusal of these various authorities is not only heavy reading, but that they are also very obtuse, and that they are actually confusing, bewildering, and tormenting to all who do not take the word of God as an ally in the work of unraveling their mysteries. For all of these authorities do agree in stating the following facts. 1. About 585 BC. And by the way, people, Bob's note here, if you ever see a, 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 a BCE or a CE used as a dating system, you know, C, like ABC, DE, DE, you know, uh, C as in Charlie and E as in Echo or uh, BCE, Boy Charlie Echo, you know you're dealing with an Antichrist. They deny, that is a way to deny that Jesus is Lord. BC, before Christ. AD, Anno Domino, Lord, day of, uh, year of our Lord. So you're dealing with, you know, when you see uh, CE and BCE, uh, they're Antichrist. Just keep that in mind because they're using that now in colleges. 
And Christian parents, you send your kids to college and you wonder why they come back as atheists. And then they're saddled with student debt that they could have bought a house with instead of paying money to the bank for the next 25 years with a dead end job that they couldn't even get a good job because, you know, a bachelor's degree means nothing, nothing today, nothing. All right. Uh, number one, about 585 BC, a notable man, an important personage, a patriarch, a saint, and essentially important someone, according to their various ways of putting it, came to Ulster, the most northern province of Ireland, accompanied, accompanied by a princess, the daughter of an eastern king, and that in, that in company with them was one Simon Brock, Breck, Brock, Barak, Barak, as it is differently spelled, and that this royal party brought with them many remarkable things. Among these was the harp, an ark, and the wonderful stone called Leah Fail, L-I-A-F-A-I-L, or the Stone of Destiny, of which we shall have much to say hereafter. Uh, Bob's note. It's also called the Stone of Scone, S-C-O-N-E. And guess what? Um, it's the coronation stone of the uh, King and Queen of England. Yeah. Two. This Eastern princess was married to King Haramon on condition made by this noble patriarch that he should abandon his former religion and build a college for the prophets. This Hur Haramon did, and the name of the school was Mur Olem, which is the name both in Hebrew and Irish for School of the Prophets. He also changed the name of his capital city, Lothair, sometimes spelled Kothair, Krofem, to that of Tara. Three, the name of this eastern princess is given as Tia Tephi, T-E-A-T-E-P-H-I. Look that up, people. Bob's note here. Look it up, people. You know, people uh, people think it's a joke. I mean, ugh. And it is a well-known fact that the royal arms of Ireland is the Harp of David and has been for 2,500 years. Uh, take a look at Ireland's, um, uh, I'm not sure if it's the flag. Uh, let me look it up real quick. Yeah, if you look at the uh, old national flag of Ireland, which has been done away with, uh, there's a harp. And it's the harp of David, according to legend, anyways. So, um, it is a well known fact that the royal arms of Ireland, it's the harp of David, and has been for 2,500 years. Ezekiel, in his riddle, when speaking of the coming of the female passenger who came to that land in the second vessel, whom he afterward proves to be a princess, speaks of the furrows of her plantation. It is a truth and to us a marvelous one that the providence of Ulster used to be called the plantation of Ulster. As anyone may know, if they will take the trouble to consult Chambers Encyclopedia on the word Ulster. Furthermore, the crown, which was worn by the sovereigns of that hitherto unaccounted for kingdom in Ireland had 12 points. 12 points. Uh, why 12? Uh, how many tribes of Israel were there? Yeah. Who shall say that the king's daughter was not planted there and that the first of the three of Ezekiel's prophetic overturns were not from Palestine to Aaron? So... And that is the end 
of this chapter, page 229. And uh, in the next chapter of this book will be uh, Jacob's Pillow Pillar Stone, which uh, I kind of mentioned earlier. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, all glory and honor to Him. Amen.